A very good morning to you all from the Philippines. Welcome to session 13 of the 2022 Asian Evaluation Week under the broad theme of influential evidence-based evaluation for green, healthy, and inclusive societies. So this session is titled Ensuring Evaluation, Influence, and Utilization. And in this session, we learn from influential evaluations from four different multilateral institutions, as well as a country case study from the Philippines. So we have a very distinguished panel today, comprising of three heads of evaluation departments of independent evaluation offices. And we also have the undersecretary from the Department of Environment and Natural Resources joining us from the Philippines. So to introduce the speakers, our lead speaker for this session is Mr. Yuha Uito. He is the director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the Global Environment Facility, headquartered in Washington, DC. We also are privileged to welcome Mr. Ashwani Mutu. He is the first Director General of the Independent Evaluation Office of the BRICS New Development Bank in our region. It's headquartered in Shanghai. We are privileged to also have Mr. Oscar Garcia, Director of the Independent Evaluation Office of the United Nations Development Program, and he is located in New York in the United States. We also have representation from the International Fund for Agricultural Development, Mr. Nanti Kesan, who is a lead evaluation officer with the Independent Office of Evaluation. And last but not least, uh, our host country is also represented here by Ms. Annalisa Revuelta Te, who is the Undersecretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources in the Philippines. Before I hand over to Yuha, a very big thank you to all my colleagues who work so hard to put this week together. It's always so impressive, you know, how it all comes together so nicely. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand the floor to Yuha, who is going to discuss and talk to us about influential evaluation of organizational policy, the case of the Global Environment Facilities Comprehensive Evaluation. Yuha, over to you now. Thank you very much, Maya. It's, it's uh, great to be here. And um, I think this is my fourth Asian Evaluation Week. And, and uh, unfortunately, the second one in, 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 in a virtual format. Um, I really wish that we could be there. But now greetings from, from the US Mid-Atlantic uh, seaboard here in Maryland. You know, to, just to set the context for this issue of um, evaluation, influence, and utility, there are times when we evaluators, we are so enamored with our technical work, with our sampling size and methodologies, that we forget, uh, forget about why we are evaluating in the first place. But evaluation is not just uh, research. It is intended to contribute to learning and to improvement of policies and programs and pr projects. The United Nations Evaluation Group, a professional network that brings together evaluators and evaluation units across the UN system, emphasizes this. They say evaluation should be making relevant and timely contributions to organizational learning informed decision-making processes and accountability for results. The UNEG goes on further to say that evaluation should go beyond the organization uh, for generating knowledge and empowering stakeholders. One of the gurus of evaluation in the US and internationally was the late uh, Carol Weiss. And here's a quote from her. She made the point that we shouldn't leave evaluation utilization to chance. We need to be intentional in this regard. And as, as is evident from the previous quotes already, so there's a whole literature on this topic. And that's for a reason, in fact, because evaluation use and utility are not automatic. On the contrary, 
evaluators, especially independent evaluators like um, myself working in an independent office and my colleagues here, we analyze organizational performance, program results and impact and the like. But we are often uh, seen as being somebody from the outside of the structures that are um, there to design and implement uh, interventions. We may be seen as someone from the sidelines offering our critical viewpoints uh, without fully understanding the situation on the ground. Or that our, our advice comes too late as a post-mortem rather than something to help the patient to thrive. The literature points uh, to how we have, have to be re relevant, credible and timely and how it is useful to work with champions inside the organization or perhaps on the governing bodies who receive and understand the value of, ev of evaluative evidence. Building on these insights, I'm going to highlight lessons from the Global Environment Facility, the GEF, uh, which is the oldest and most established public financial mechanism to support um, the envir support environmental uh, solutions, uh, support uh, developing countries to uh, live up to their obligations under the environmental conventions that they have signed up to. Evaluation is hardwired into the GEF system. The central role of the independent evaluation office, which I have the honor of leading at this moment, is uh, inscribed in the instrument for the establishment of the restructured GEF. The instrument squarely places the responsibility of ensuring that GEF policies, programs, operational strategies and projects are monitored and evaluated on a regular basis on the governing council. This has been recognized as crucial uh, given that the GEF is supposed to be a, an innovative financier in a rapidly changing field where new solutions to emerging problems must be anchored in science and based on evaluative evidence. The apex of the IEO work program is the comprehensive evaluation that we conduct every four years as a key input uh, feeding into the replenishment of the GEF trust fund. The comprehensive evaluations that go by the abbreviation OPS uh, pull together evidence from a large number of evaluations that the IEO conducts throughout the four-year uh, programming cycle, covering the GEF performance and organizational effective efficiency. Apart from the programmatic results and impact, uh, we look at issues such as policies, processes, safeguards, gender, indigenous peoples, results-based management, knowledge management, and the country resource allocation system. Here's the overall generic uh, process for conducting these OPSs. I want to highlight this for two reasons. First, because there are not many organizations that I'm aware of that conduct regular comprehensive evaluations. And secondly, because the process is a key to ensuring influence. Like the name implies, my office, the IEO, is independent of the management and the director reports directly to the council. This independence doesn't, however, mean isolation. In order for us to ensure the relevance of our evaluations, we conduct extensive consultations with the GEF management and the agencies that uh, implement the projects um, when we put together our multi-year work program. We also keep the council posted, and at the end of the day, our work program and budget are approved by the council. Like I said, there are a large number of evaluations and studies that contribute to the overall evaluation. Each of these component evaluations is presented to the council on a rolling basis as we complete them. During the penultimate year of the GF replenishment cycle, we first present summaries of what the evidence tells us, and then a fully integrated draft comprehensive evaluation to the council and to the replenishment participants who basically consist uh, of the established and emerging donors and groupings uh, of the recipient countries. And also to the GEF agencies and other stakeholders, uh, stakeholders such as the uh, 
CSO network. The findings of these evaluations and their implications for future policies and programs are then discussed in detail in the governing bodies and the management must provide information on how they intend to respond to them. During my tenure, we've completed two comprehensive evaluations, OPS 6 and OPS 7 in 2017 and 2021 respectively. At least in these cases that I, I can attest to, all of the recommendations from these evaluations were endorsed by the governing bodies and were then incorporated into the policy and programming documents for the upcoming replenishment period. Let me highlight uh, through a couple of examples what this means in practice and what our evidence is that uh, this is actually influential. A few years back, we conducted an evaluation of transformation and change. This was based on a thorough analysis of a purposive sample of completed projects that were evaluated to be particularly successful in instigating deep systemic change in the area where they operated. We wanted to understand what such projects had in common. Key findings included that transformation doesn't happen serendipitously, but it is important to design for it. This includes building in factors such as financial sustainability, policy influence and policy change, and market transformation in the intervention design at the outset. Through this evaluation, we were able to identify factors that would become design criteria for GEF-funded projects later. In OPS 7, completed last year, uh, we homed in on the importance of innovation as a prerequisite for transformational change and for the GEF pushing the boundaries for global environmental sustainability. Since innovation is uh, associated with some, with some level of risk, we recommended that the GEF should clearly articulate the level of acceptable risk across the various instruments and approaches that it uses for clarity across the partnership and to encourage innovation through a managed approach. We said that the GEF could consider establishing a specific window for financing innovation with a higher risk tolerance. This recommendation was picked up by the governors and management both and the new programming directions for the GEF 8 uh, replenishment period that just started in July created a dedicated funding window for innovation and targeted research. Similarly, when it comes to the private sector as a GEF partner, both OPS 6 and OPS 7 called for strengthening private sector engagement, which has been a challenge. The GEF now has its first private sector engagement strategy and the role of the private sector is now mainstreamed across the GEF-8 approaches and programming. Here are some further areas, more on the operational or organizational side, in which evaluations um, have had demonstrable influence on how, how the GEF operates. They include, for example, how the GEF engages with program countries, through a country engagement strategy, which builds upon an older country support program. Um, they include also uh, where the GEF focus should be on in its funding. And, uh, and for example, a balance between uh, different groupings of countries, for example, LDCs, the least developed countries, uh, seeds, small island developing states, and, and the large middle-income countries like China, Indonesia, India, uh, which are very important for the global environment um, because they are mega diverse countries and their contributions to climate change are also very, very important. But on the other hand, they have um, more resources available to themselves than, for example, LDCs and SIDS have. And also we've been uh, providing um, analysis and 
recommendations regarding um, the country allocation, resource allocation formula to the countries, and which, uh, which has been tweaked actually based on largely on our evaluations um, at every replenishment uh, cycle. So just to conclude, I'd like to summarize the key factors that have contributed to the considerable influence that evaluation enjoys in the GEF partnership. As I said in the beginning, this is based on the central role that was established for independent evaluation in the GEF structure and the original instrument. First, we as evaluators must understand internal priorities and help the organization make evidence-based decisions. Therefore, we need proper planning and consultation with various levels of stakeholders, from the governing council to the management and to the implementing partners, regarding their priorities and information needs. This doesn't compromise the independence of evaluation at all, as we will still design and conduct the evaluations as we best see fit, and we'll report on the findings frankly, warts and all. Furthermore, we also do include topics that the management may find um, sensitive, to put it that way. In fact, um, the independence of the evaluation function is key to its uh, credibility. To have impact, the evidence presented in an evaluation must be credible and, uh, and be perceived as such. To enhance this aspect, we regularly engage external experts for uh, quality assurance. For example, in these uh, comprehensive evaluations, um, I always have a high level external ex expert panel who can verify and, and quality assure that um, what we do makes sense and that the conclusions that we draw are uh, sensible also. For every GEF evaluation, and particularly for the comprehensive evaluations, we put effort into defining the focus, scope, approach, and methodologies of the evaluation, and all of the component studies that com contribute to it. We also utilize the most suitable methods, data, and approaches for the comprehensive and component evaluations, and importantly, we communicate them openly, ensuring transparency in all aspects of the evaluation. We put a lot of thought into ensuring the coherence of the evaluation work program, and we explore important themes from various angles and triangulate findings through different data sources and studies. We also place importance on the development of recommendations at the correct level. This applies to the individual evaluations that focus on specific areas, as well as the comprehensive evaluations whose recommendations are intended to be more strategic. As we develop the recommendations, we need to understand what is feasible and actionable without being too narrowly prescriptive, uh, while at the same time giving clear directions based on solid evidence. For this, it is again useful to engage the management, both at the GF secretariat and agencies, as they will be the ones who will have to implement uh, the recommended actions. And needless to say, timely completion and communication of the evaluation is of, of utmost importance. A brilliant analysis with great insights on how policies and programs could be improved will only be a source of frustration if it arrives too late when such policies and programs are, have already been designed. We have actually written a book uh, based on this experience and based on the experience of the GF comprehensive evaluations it was co-authored by my uh, deputy and chief evaluation officer Gita Batra. Uh, Oswaldo Feinstein, whom many of you would know probably, and who, who has been uh, an independent advisor to, uh, to the two latest OPSs uh, and, and myself. Um, this book is available as an open access publication online. I, I'll try to put on the, on the uh, link into the chat later, but, but you can also find it if you go to the Routledge Publishers uh, website and Google my name and, 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 and you'll find the book and you can download it for free. 
and I hope you will uh, find it uh, interesting and read it. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yuha. So we heard from Yuha on you know, both the theory from the evaluation literature and the application within the global environment facility context. And he identified several factors that make evaluations influential and enhance utilization and uptake in the context of GEF. Uh, we'll now zoom into the Philippines and we'll have Undersecretary Annalisa Rebuelta take talk to us about the application of the global environment facility studies in the Philippines. So over to you, Annalisa. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Yuha, for a very uh, substantive uh, presentation. As you can see, what I would like to share uh, based on the presentation of you is how does the, how, or how did the Jeff Evaluation actually influence the work in the Philippines? Um, uh, Philippines was one of the fortunate countries who was selected sometime in 2007 to have a Jeff country portfolio evaluation. So as I mentioned, the Philippines is one of the fortunate countries who was selected to uh, evaluate under a country portfolio and that uh, evaluation was aimed to um, understand what are the results of the Jeff portfolio that Philippines and evaluate whether they fit the national strategies and priorities. And as a result of that evaluation, the, it was concluded that the job support has been relevant generally to the Philippine development plans and priorities uh, environmental management. However, uh, they also pointed out, the evaluation also pointed out that uh, the, we need to address the climate environmental trends and also look at the limitations regarding uh, compliance and also the evaluation also emphasized that there are some there were some inefficiencies in the uh, implementation of GEM projects. And um, there were recommendations drawn from that uh, evaluation such as coming out uh, of the country strategies that it to include uh, compliance with environmental policies and regulations in our project design and implementation. Looking at uh, climate change resilience as a component of our project uh, development, and also improving the efficiency of jet mechanisms. At that time, we have just uh, formed our uh, interagency mechanism for uh, consultation so that you know the issue there is which project should be endorsed and which project should be allocated this much. So it started as an uh, interagency mechanism for allocation. But because of this evaluation, we saw an opportunity to ensure that we implement these evaluations through the GEM National Steering Committee. We uh, institutionalized this committee, uh, which serves as a platform for a more meaningful stakeholder engagement so that we can really improve the GEM mechanism and uh, come up with diverse concepts on how we can really improve environmental management in our uh, proposed GEM projects. So as a result also of that evaluation in 2008, we conducted a strategic planning and country dialogue participated by diverse uh, multi-sectoral uh, organizations, private sector, national government agencies. Um, we developed, we identified our major goals, our uh, guiding principles and our strategies. And you can see there on how we uh, really inputted the uh, findings and the recommendations in the evaluation. And then um, in also on almost in the same year, 2007, the Philippines was again fortunately selected to have the case study of the small grants program. So they want to know how SGP is implemented in the Philippines at the country level. And some of the conclusions made was that SGP has been effective in providing support to national commitments, uh, to the international conventions, how the SGP has also produced global environmental benefits uh, and how uh, we're able to, or how much of our GEF has, uh, uh, how much does SGP consist of our overall over GEF uh, grants. And as a result of that uh, GEF uh, mechanism that we have, 
we were the NGO community was inspired to uh, create a, um, you know, a new organization, the Communities for Global Environment Foundation. Because at the time, the Philippines was already considered as a related country, and therefore we cannot access anymore the SGP. So we developed a new mechanism where we package our SGP into a um, full-size project, which can be part of our uh, overall um, uh, application uh, portfolio. The conclusion also cited that uh, that uh, we were that the SGP implementation has been successful in obtaining co-financing from both countries and other donors. And some of the recommendations in the SGP is that there should be an active participation the development of the Chad countries uh, assistance uh, strategy. Also, we highlighted there the need for monitoring reporting and evaluating the short and long term results and increasing transparency to the uh, SGP website. Apart from these evaluations, uh, we also conducted, we were inspired in this evaluation work that we conducted our own uh, evaluation of uh, SGP. Uh, uh, in the Philippines, where I'm uh, sorry, this is still the the SGP uh, uh, assessment. Uh, these are some of the things that uh, were recommended: stronger social inclusion, environmental diversity conservation, stronger civil society representation. We had an SGP national state committee at that time, and project technical inclusion with the community proposals, alignment of our national targets, and build global benefits. And most importantly, this landscape based strategic community project. So, because we, we used to approach this in a start alone community uh, approach in, in our SGP implementation, and that so that if we want to create an, an impact, we have to address this in a more uh, comprehensive, integrated, and uh, landscape approach. Uh, so, therefore, as a result of these evaluations, we started to develop biodiversity friendly enterprises as one of the um, key. Uh, component or design of our STP projects. We also created the citizen scientists and conservation warriors. We also look into securing assessment rights as part of our STP programs. It's not just providing them one time livelihood, but really looking at their uh, long term temporal security. And we saw the we acknowledge that partner communities are social threats for wider diversity conservation. So, as you can see, um, the, the scope of the effect or the influence of the evaluation and how we design and look at strategically our approach to community development. So as I mentioned earlier, as a result of these evaluations, we were inspired to conduct our own uh, Gen 4 and Gen 5 assessment. So we, um, we, uh, the results of the assessment uh, revealed that there needs to be a there needs to be a use of multi stakeholder approach in selecting and prioritizing projects. As you can see, even though we have the national steering committee, we still see the the need to really still engage a broader stakeholders. We need to engage uh, the JAP agencies uh, according to their comparative advantage and on the first come first serve basis. And also the need to conduct by implementation activities to avoid delay in the project implementation and strengthening the roles of the executive agencies and other stakeholders uh, in project operations, again, to avoid delay and other um, inefficiencies in the general implementation. Um, I just want to mention some of the projects that uh, result that based on our evaluation, uh, the, or learnings from the evaluation, we developed a project, Smart Seas, which the yields of strengthening marine protected areas instead to conserve Marine key biodiversity areas project. And we have involved uh, several local government units in various municipalities for management, for example, of the Tanyan State Protected Seascapes. We also have established the Burley Island Passage Marine Protected Area and Law Enforcement Network. And the local government agencies, enforcement agencies were all, were all uh, engaged in this uh, project. And then most recently, we have this. Uh, project regarding PCB management for electric cooperatives. You know, this community, Bagong Silang Kalaokan, it used to be, it's a community where small children uh, gather the uh, waste from computers, from other uh, other e-waste. So you can see the danger, the health hazards. And out of this project, 
were able to uh, uh, establish a material storage facility, which serve as the treatment storage and disposal facilities to empower the women dismantlers and skills upgrading with all the youth so that they will know the uh, the proper management of this waste and the uh, awareness in general on the part of the management. And then lastly, uh, as a result of this uh, uh, series of evaluations that we have experienced in the past, we have institutionalized our national portfolio formulation exercise where in every cycle of the GEP, we hold this multi stakeholder meeting, uh, including implementing agencies, uh, uh, and we gather on what would be our long term uh, perspective of the GEP of a certain cycle portfolio. So, for example, recently we just held our GEP national portfolio formulation exercise. So we cannot just so we will not be able to I mean, we will not just identify projects randomly, but we will really anchor it on our development priorities and uh, good climate lens. We ensure inclusiveness and resilience in all our projects. So there's now a, a long term perspective. So I I, I believe really that uh, evaluation is key so that we can really improve on what we are doing, especially in our development. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Annalisa. So we got a nice close look at how evidence from evaluations and recommendations from evaluations actually have quite a big impact at the country level. Um, and Annalisa also gave us some examples of how the learning from evaluation has influenced at an organizational level uh, what DNR does and the priorities that it sets for itself. Time for us to zoom out again and turn to Mr. Oscar Garcia. Um, Oscar, of course, is based in New York now and he leads the Independent Evaluation Office, but not so long ago, he was in fact in Rome, uh, heading the Evaluation Department of the International Fund for Agricultural Development. So Oscar is gonna share his experience with influential evaluations from both these organizations. Uh, he's going to talk not just about the positive experiences, but also highlight some of the challenges uh, that he faced along the way. So over to you, Oscar. Thank you very much, Maya. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to be with you today and all the participants in this session. And I would like to start by thanking the Asian Development Bank for the kind invitation to participate in this exchange. <clears throat> Indeed, I would like to uh, share with you, um, I started conducting evaluations more than 25 years ago. And um, in, uh, as such, uh, in my home country, Bolivia, I was really very diligently uh, applying my mind to uh, learn about the interventions that I was trying to understand and really evaluate to, uh, uh, to provide uh, the results of an evaluation process. Therefore, allow me to share a few of the reflections that come with the so many years of experience with all of you in uh, trying to conduct uh, evaluations more rigorously and with more utility. And so that's why I really welcome the opportunity to uh, reflect a bit about uh, evaluation influence and utilization. And my colleague, uh, Yuha Wito, started the conversation asking, why do we conduct evaluations? And I think it's a perfect question and very valid for the broad community that is participating today in this uh, seminar. In my view, I want to conduct evaluations. I want to apply this critical thinking. I want to really uh, be able to ask hard questions in a very systematic way because I want to improve things. I want things to be better. And what I mean by things, I mean by the mandate, in this case of multilateral development institutions that are committed to either reduce poverty, improve uh, the relationship between uh, uh, people and the planet and nature, uh, uh, provide uh, humanitarian assistance, or address the so many needs that our countries are facing in the uh, long pathway to a sustainable development. And therefore, it is 
this aim of trying to improve things that I think make the evaluations more influential. Therefore, for improvements to take place, uh, we need positive changes to achieve the intended objectives of our evaluation. Therefore, I see a very strong connection between the conduct of evaluation and the potential for change. But in order for an evaluation to be able to contribute to a positive change, first, you need to understand very well the context in which this development intervention is taking place. You need to understand very well the system within this uh, particular intervention is uh, taking place. And once you do that, once you understand that system, once you understand that context, and for that, you may apply a very rigorous uh, uh, methodological approach for data collection and analysis, then you provide recommendations for action. But without action, there is no change. Right? And therefore, to me, influential evaluations are those evaluations that are conducive to action, to corrective action for trying to improve things. In, and we have heard marvelous examples from uh, Undersecretary uh, uh, Revuelta uh, in the Philippines about the importance of biodiversity conservation through the small grants program in the Philippines, right? And therefore that's the type of change, that's the type of action, sustained action that we would like to see. So how can evaluation utility be improved? I think um, <clears throat> one of the main uh, aspects of this, and my colleague Yuha has uh, addressed uh, those as well, is the quality of recommendations. And what do we mean by the quality of recommendations? Because most of our evaluation reports do have recommendations, but how do we assess if those are really of good quality? First and foremost, as said uh, uh, before, it should be the timeliness, right? Therefore, all this analysis should be uh, in a time that uh, leads to better action, that leads to decision making. Uh, the marvelous analysis without the timeliness to uh, induce uh, corrective action may not be uh, as, as useful as or influential as we may expect. Secondly, I think it's the specificity. Uh, evaluations that are too broad and too general uh, are welcome because they uh, allow you to reflect. Uh, uh, however, if they are not uh, specific enough, they will not be action oriented. Therefore, the ability of evaluators to break down a complex topic, a complex uh, undertaking into actionable uh, places uh, enhances the quality of these recommendations. But how do we achieve that? And I said, nowadays, to address uh, challenges such as climate change, such as conflict, such as entrenched inequalities in our societies, we need to have a systemic perspective. We need to understand that system, and we need to enhance our ability to address the assumptions behind the interventions that we are evaluating. If we are able to address those assumptions, we may be enlightened by understanding better that context. However, in order to provide recommendations, my approach and my suggestion is that we need theory-based evaluations. Why theory-based? Because no matter what area are you working in, you're not new to that area. There is a literature that was existing before the evaluation took place that really thought about what is the theoretical approach for that change to take place. And therefore, in my view, evaluations need to have the ability to explain, the ability to explain what, have, what are the factors that led to the current level of performance under a current system. And if we miss that explanatory ability of evaluations, the systematic uh, uh, and systemic perspective may be lost and the quality of the recommendations leading to actions may be lost. And it is this ability to explain that will also come with the novelty. I think uh, when we uh, uh, conduct an evaluations, probably the evaluant, the people who are 
undertaking a particular intervention program project or a policy or strategy, they know more about that program than us evaluators. However, it is this theory-based approach, this theoretical approach, this ability to reflect that would allow us to provide some novelty in our analysis and bring a fresh perspective in order to address some systemic issues that may not be seen from the closeness of a project implementation and require an external view from an independent evaluation. So let me now very briefly illustrate with two examples. The first one is an evaluation of uh, the uh, UNDP strategic plan for the years 2018-2021. UNDP undertakes uh, on a regular basis four-year strategic plans, and it is the responsibility of my office, the Independent Evaluation Office, to really uh, assess uh, the, the, the extent to which the plan, uh, plan objectives were achieved. So, what are the recommendations for the latest uh, uh, evaluation of uh, UNDP strategic plan? That to meet the increasing demand driven by the COVID-19 pandemic, UNDP should prioritize digital transformation, address the administrative bottlenecks that hinder innovation, very important, ensure improvements to knowledge management system, better track and scale up successful innovations. UNDP needs to evolve its business model expand its adaptive management capabilities and develop additional funding modalities and funding models that increase agility and flexibility. Results-based management and learning from success and failures remain key areas for improvement. Therefore, UNDP should timely deliver on its people for 2030 strategy, its human resource strategy, to improve st staff capabilities for system thinking and transformation. As you can see, very thoughtful recommendations, right? And uh, all the recommendations were accepted by management. Right? However, uh, when I wonder the, the extent to which this uh, uh, evaluation was influential in terms of really producing the expected actions and changes to improve the ability of the system to deliver, we see it as a work in progress because of the complexity of the myriad and sets of recommendations. Let me now give you another example. The evaluation of uh, IFAD's financial architecture conducted in 2018. The fund's financial architecture was under strain since 2013. It could no longer support an expanding program of loans and grants. Moreover, the financial architecture did not pass the test of financial sustainability. Accumulating losses lead to an erosion of IFAD's equity. So the evaluation recommended that important reforms be undertaken to address the factors affecting IFAD's financial sustainability, the mobilization of financial resources and the rationale by which these were allocated. It also recommended introducing new financial products to respond to the demands of borrowing member states, as well as to internal and external financial governance. As a result of these recommendations, IFAD management and governing bodies adopted measures to address uh, this, including first, the revision of the debt sustainability framework, the accreditation of IFAD from rating agencies such as Standard and Poor and Fitch uh, with a double A plus to leverage resources from the financial markets and Thirdly, the introduction of a private sector window, all contributing to a more solid architecture to finance rural development needs. Therefore, as we can see, the recommendations of this very important evaluation were more focused, were actionable, and in a way led to a significant uh, transformation within the organization to ensure its uh, financial sustainability and the fulfillment of its uh, mission. With these uh, uh, examples, I really wanted to uh, uh, share with you some of the reflections and uh, would be very happy to uh, continue the dialogue with a myriad of uh, excellent panelists and experts that uh, accompany me uh, this uh, session. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Oscar.
um, at least for me personally, there's one really key takeaway from Oscar's presentation. Uh, he described you know, his experience with the influence of evaluations in two different organizations. But there was one thing he said early on, uh, which really talked about not just instrumental use, which is what you know, we normally think of for influence, uh, but what's known as conceptual use in the literature. And that really reflects you know, back to Oscar's reference to the uh, theory-based evaluation. So you produce knowledge uh, that may not necessarily need to any action, but it certainly illuminates you know, the path forward for the organization. So with that, I'd like to turn now to uh, Mr. Nandikesan, who's a lead evaluation officer with IFAD. And he'll you know, take us deep into IFAD and tell us a little bit about influential organizational programming and, you know, and his conceptualization of evaluation as a system. So over to you, Nanti. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, uh, for the audience. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, and uh, giving, an, uh, giving an opportunity for us to explain some of the issues that may be pertinent to all of us and improve on our thinking. Uh, I want to take up to follow up on what um, uh, Oscar said about the importance of uh, evaluations explaining um, and recommending, making solid recommendations, and then look at Yuha and Annalisa pointed out in terms of looking at evaluation, not only as individual evaluation, but also as a body of knowledge that could influence uh, uh, decisions. Now, I want to uh, start with, uh, if you want to do this, then uh, one of the issues that uh, we were interested, uh, particularly a topic relevant to this, uh, uh, session, uh, this session as well as this event, is uh, greening and how do we build a resilient, uh, climate resilient society. Green society, in that sense, one of the things that we also notice is our actions have consequences to ecosystems, whether we intend or not many of our interventions may have consequences. Take agriculture, which IFAD is primarily interested in. Agriculture is affected by climate, by climate change, particularly smallholder farmers are vulnerable uh, to climate uh, change effects. At the same time, agricultural sector also contributes, if we were to use uh, FAO's 2018 analysis, it contributes 17% of the greenhouse gases. So agriculture has consequences to bring about the climate changes as well that it is being affected by. So this is a cycle. And in this cycle, it is important, therefore, we are conscious and aware of what our actions, whether it is infrastructure, whether it is agro technology, some form of agro technology improvement, whatever the intervention is, what are the environmental consequences of that action? Even if the uh, intervention may not think of it as a intended consequence, that could be unintended consequence to the environment and, and the ecosystems around it. The question is, how do we then systematically analyze this? And this is not a one-off effort. Every single um, uh, intervention of IFAD then has to be um, assessed against whether it is how well it is adapting, uh, helping farmers adapt to climate change and how well it is contributing to environmental and natural resource management. So this, how do we bring about this is the question that we are asking. So in, uh, in the, in, to put it in the context of what was being discussed earlier, how do we produce a body of knowledge, a credible bo body of knowledge um, and then ensure utilization of that body of knowledge, holding the organization accountable, making sure that it um, uh, does project by project, year by year, but as a system, as a collective. So that is the purpose of uh, this uh, analysis. So uh, the diagram shows it looks complicated, but it shows some system that you need in order to get it going. <laughs> It is not that every organization has to follow the same thing, but if it happens to have this particular system and uh, mechanisms could differ, uh, elements could differ, but the bottom line is first, the, it's much easier for evaluations uh, if the organization itself recognizes environment is a issue that they have to worry about in their interventions. So IFAD has introduced safeguards, environmental safeguards, so that makes it easier for evaluators to go and say, hey, 
were you um, taking the evaluation safeguard seriously? So that part of having a corporate priority assigned to it, and then they also are more receptive to ev what evaluation self to say. Uh, so first part is we are on the same page. Uh, make sure that the management is on the same page as evaluators. And the second part, of course, is Evaluation should not be ad hoc. It should not be the whim of the particular director or evaluation lead, but it should be institutionalized. So the policy, evaluation policy, should give license for evaluation office and the evaluators to evaluate every project uh, for this uh, environment um, uh, impact or environmental consequences. So once the higher level mandate is given, then there should be guidance for evaluators to how to do it. Uh, so the, there should be very clear guidance on how do you mainstream environmental consequences in your all your evaluations. So that is once we have the policy and the guidance there, then you need some capacities actually to do it when you are evaluating. Do you have the resources and the necessary capacities in the evaluation team to actually get the job done, to look at the environmental consequences. And then of course, once you produce, once you have the capacities and you produce this report, the report has to be quality assured, particularly in terms of, in this case, in terms of what are the environmental consequences, uh, whether they have been reliably assessed. And then of course, the evaluations need to be used and have uh, for learning and accountability purposes by the organization. So here is how uh, an example of how it is being used or it could be used. All uh, IFAD projects are rated and um, they are rated against evaluation criteria. The evaluation criteria are the regular OECD DAC criteria plus additional IFAD specific criteria that IFAD has evolved. And those include explicitly uh, at one point, uh, how well the project is or intervention is supporting smallholder farmers adapt to climate change. That is how well they are if I'm supporting climate adaptation of farmers. And the other part is how well it is helping farmers manage environmental and natural resources. So these are the two criteria and the criteria is rated on a one to six scale and uh, from highly unsatisfactory to highly satisfactory. And it turns out if we look at each year, taking a three-year average, each year we have about 25 to 30 new evaluations coming in. From that, we understand how well the projects are behaving. So each year and three-year moving average, as well as we also look at each year, we report this to the board, how over the last 10 years, how the uh, ratings, uh, how the performance in these two criteria are. This is not the only two we report, but I'm selecting this to show that this is reported to the governing body. And what, what can we tell from this graph is that it claims that 90%, for instance, of the 2019 um, uh, evaluations um, show uh, that projects are performing moderately satisfactory or better in terms of ENRM. Um, so, and it also shows a trend uh, over the 10 years, which tells the uh, organization and the board whether we are doing, how well we are doing, and what is there a trend there, or is there a, if there's a decline, why is the decline, if there's an increase, why the increase, how can we strengthen that, and so on. So this evaluation body now, the 30 evaluations together, they could be anything about infrastructure. They have a range of topics. Something will be talking about agro, te agro technology, something about livestock, something about infrastructure development, whatever their goal is. They are also looking at all these things, how well they are focusing on ENRM and climate adaptation. So this is where the system works, but is this enough? Um, so having a system perspective is important, but then I want to also, touch upon one of the recent evaluations that we did, which was a thematic evaluation of uh, IFAD support to climate adaptation of smallholder farmers, which looked at the entire climate responses in the last decade, 238 projects in 70 countries, and looked at how well they are supporting smallholder farmers. And in that, it turned out first that we don't have a proper resilience framework for climate um, uh, change adaptation to understand, to measure how well we are doing. 
So we have proxy indicators, but we never target like how many hectares are brought under climate smart agriculture, but we can't tell whether the farmers actually were able to withstand the last famine or last flood or whatever it is. So the direct resilience measures were not there. So it's a challenge for us to really understand how well we are supporting the adaptation. The second observation the evaluation found out was 70% of EFIS projects do actually harm the environment. Um, and uh, there are various degrees, some are closer to uh, doing no harm, uh, but uh, 50% could be said to be approaching doing no harm or uh, better, 30% are clearly doing no harm or better, but there is an issue there. So then that conflicts with this, uh, that has raised this question, that is looking at the ecosystem, how agricultural solutions are affecting the ecosystem, and then when we compare that with the ENRM statistic here, 90% are rated moderately satisfactory or satisfactory, it raises questions as to how, what methods we are using to assess the rating of ENRM. So it is useful to have individual evaluations to occasionally check the system to see how well it is functioning uh, and whether it is functioning as it, in, as it is intended to. I will stop here and I'm happy to take uh, questions during the discussion. Over. Thanks a lot, Nandi. Um, I think we have Ashwani who's going to come in. He doesn't have slides, but given his you know 30 plus years of experience, I'm sure he has a lot to say on uh, influence of evaluations and factors that actually contribute to making them influential. So over to you, Ashwani. Thank you very much, Maya, for giving me the floor. Um, <clears throat> so to put my comments into context, I just want to highlight that um, the New Development Bank of the BRICS is a relatively young organization. It's been operational for just over seven years. And also at the same time, the Independent Evaluation Office was established with my appointment earlier this year. So I'm not really going to be able to share with you concrete examples from the New Development Bank of Evaluation Influence and Utilization, even though we have already launched a couple of project level evaluations respectively in Brazil on renewable energy and in India on, on rural roads. So perhaps next year I'll be able to give you more, more you know, concrete examples from the new development bank. Um, at the same time, um, as, as Maya mentioned, and as you might have seen uh, from my bio, I have worked, of course, majority of my experience has been in evaluation, but I have also spent six to seven years on the management side in a multilateral organization. And based on this combination of both evaluation and experience on the management side, I want to share with you a handful of what I believe are critical success factors uh, for ensuring evaluation influence and utilization, which I also think are applicable across multilateral development organizations. And before I do that, I think my distinguished colleagues and panelists have already touched upon most of the points I'm going to make. So um, I will, all I'll be doing is really re-emphasizing some of those points and perhaps bringing them in from a slightly different perspective. So the first point I want to highlight uh, in ensuring evaluation influence and utilization is the need really for multilateral organizations to invest in building a coherent results, learning and evaluation culture across the organization. And this includes uh, the country level offices. Uh, and the starting point for that, I think, is to really put in place necessary policies, instruments, and tools to build such a culture. Uh, in particular, for example, by having an overarching evaluation policy. And at the NDB, we just had our first evaluation policy approved in August, but also introducing state-of-the-art evaluation methodologies, possibly documenting them even in an evaluation manual, and ensuring that formal and informal evaluation learning loops are set up in key processes. And one example of such a learning loop is to ensure that project design documents um, include a dedicated section to the treatment of lessons learned from evaluation and they, how they can be actually operationalized in design. And the second, point, second sub point of my, of my first overarching point is that building such a culture really requires time. 
And it also requires senior management commitment. It's not a one-time activity. For this, um, as one of the components, I think it's fundamental to, to devote attention to evaluation capacity uh, development, both within the operations and in evaluation, including at the country level. Uh, and at the NDB, we have to complement evaluation capacity development. At the NDB, we have introduced what we call an evaluation sensitization plan across the organization for the time being. And we plan to roll it out also to member countries with a series of complementary activities, such as ensuring IEOs participation in periodic corporate inductions, um, organizing evaluation lectures with dedicated high level speakers on specific themes, ensuring that evaluation has a strong web presence and so on. And finally, on this point, I made reference to management commitment. I think that's fundamental and I am sure my colleagues will also agree with that. Uh, management commitment at the highest level is fundamental to provide the right signals and to provide the right environment to ensure evaluations can be influential and utilized. The second point and the second critical factor, success factor, it was also alluded to by the previous speakers, is to focus on participation and ownership in evaluation among key operational staff, but also other key stakeholders at the country level um, in evaluation processes without compromising on independent, on the independence of analysis. Um, and uh, you know, promoting participation is essential at key stages in evaluation, such as giving opportunities to, to operational staff and others to comment, for instance, on the terms of reference of the evaluation, to comment on the draft report. And this would not only enhance the quality of the evaluations analysis, but also build ownership in the findings of evaluations, in their recommendations, thus hopefully strengthening evaluation influence and utilization. The third point I want to underline as a critical success factor, in my opinion, is ensuring that the organization's board of directors or executive board, as they might be called in, in other places, as well as the subcommittees of the board dealing with evaluation, that they devote su sufficient time, attention, and resources to evaluation. Uh, the board has a fundamental oversight role in holding management accountable in implementation of evaluation lessons and recommendations, there, thereby hopefully again contributing to enhancing influence and utility. I'm sure my colleagues on the panel will have a lot to say about this, um, but one example is to ensure that the board really discusses systematically strategic evaluation findings and that evaluation really features on the agenda of the board on a recurrent basis and that the board really uh, helps the management in put in, to put in place action plans to operationalize those recommendations, thereby, thereby enhancing influence and utilization. The fourth point I want to underline is, and this was also mentioned, is the timeliness of evaluation. My colleagues already highlighted that. And this, they, they especially highlighted um, the importance of uh, the timely delivery of evaluation results so that they can feed into further processes, whether it's development of a policy or a project. But I also want to emphasize, and I think this was also mentioned by Oscar, is, is the timing in selecting a topic for evaluation. That is also critical. So there is, on one hand, the timely delivery of the evaluation results, but secondly, and and related to that is also ensuring the right time to do a particular evaluation. And my final point, so I can stop at that one, is about transparency and evidence trail. I think utilization and influence can only be achieved if evaluation processes are really transparent. Uh, and when I, when I mean transparent, I mean evaluation reports and the terms of references really should transparently document the methodologies that are being deployed, the data collection instruments that have been utilized, the data that has been made available, the bibliographies, this really will enhance the credibility and will also build that ownership in, in the utilization of, of evaluation and that, or, uh, results, findings and recommendations. And um, that would also help in uh, ensuring a coherent, transparency would also help in uh, ensuring a coherent evidence trail uh, in evaluations. I think that is fundamental that audiences are able to see that the recommendations are clearly anchored in the conclusions and that the conclusions are also 
deriving from evaluation findings and analysis. So with those five overarching points, I would like to stop here. And uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and space to talk to you. And I also look forward to engaging with the audience as we move forward in this panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Ashwani. That was a great sum up. Um, I think you touched on a lot of the points that the previous uh, speakers highlighted. Uh, there's a really important question that Manny Jimenez, the DG of IED, has posed in the chat box. Uh, and his question is, could, great to see the passion for influence and the example. So we've seen a number of case studies presented in the session. Could some of the panel members reflect on how evaluation units can monitor systematically and report to others regarding influence? Any examples of indicators that can be credibly used? Um, and he goes on to say, of course, we've heard a number of case studies. Uh, so he says, or can this be done only through case studies and examples? So uh, long question, but very important one. How do you systematically monitor and are there examples of indicators that you could credibly recommend uh, for other evaluation units to consider? So who wants to go first? You, how do you want to comment? Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, well, I think that um, all of the organizations that are represented here probably um, have some sort of a management action record uh, process, uh, which we, also also have in the in the gef and that basically means that um, um that you monitor um all the all the you know actions that follow from evaluations and we have actually recently changed the system uh, it used to be so that uh, the gf council would um um endorse the recommendations that the evaluations uh, put forth and then there would be a management response and and the management responses would often be um perfunctory to put it that way they would say that okay we take note of these uh, recommendations and and we agree with them and we will implement them but we moved uh, from that system uh, about two years ago uh, to a system where the onus is really on the management action plan so uh, the gf council nowadays then um, um, endorses or doesn't or improves or changes um, the management uh, response that the, uh, that the that the management is putting forth in in uh, response to the evaluation and and um, and uh, that uh, management response should be now more serious with an action plan actually and and then that action plan the implementation of that action plan is monitored actually by my office then we uh, provide an annual report to the council on 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 the uh, status of implementation of these uh, various actions thanks Thanks, Yuha. Well, on the first question on how we do it systematically in our case, so we uh, started the project of focal communication where we develop an MLP manual that, as mentioned by the other resource persons, supported that we have a dedicated uh, unit to handle and ensure that we operationalize that MLP manual. The second question regarding indicators, one example is, for example, uh, Yes, with respect to protected area, uh, we develop this indicator like certain percentage that their protected area is under sustainable management and identify means of verification, such as whether the protected area management board is being regularly and or uh, that the protected area management plan is already developed. So these are the sort of indicators what, that we develop so that when we monitor. The projects we engage how much uh, thanks Anunisa. nice examples from the country which i'm sure a number of our attendees from the countries would you know would find very useful 
Um, Oscar is going next, yes. and then I think Ashwani also had something to say on this, and then we can end with uh, Nandi. Go ahead, Oscar. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed, uh, in UNDP we do track uh, the the, the follow-up to the recommendations, uh, and therefore the actions contained in the management responses. Uh, last year we did a study of the quality of these uh, actions. And uh, when doing an analysis of the quality, we found that uh, for independent evaluations, uh, yes, uh, the, the actions really address most of the spirit of the recommendations. However, in the case of decentralized evaluations, that was not the situation. And uh, that analysis proved that when a management response contained a single action in follow-up to the recommendations, usually the uh, management response is not is not of good quality because one single action may not address the complexity of the recommendation uh, contained in the evaluation report. But uh, going to try to respond to Mani's uh, question in terms of do we have a system to systematically record the influence of evaluation reports, that is a challenging one. Uh, we would like to have one that uh, and, and some indicators in that direction but we have not uh, developed one that really records influence because I am of the thinking that an evaluation has different uh, uh, lifespans. It could be very influential when it was released or it could be more influential uh, uh, sometimes later when the organization really needs to address the issues contained in that particular evaluation report and therefore that makes the uh, establishing such a system a bit more complicated. Thanks. Oscar. Ashwani. Thank you. Uh, briefly, Oscar used to be my boss in EPAD, so I think alike, and he has already covered partly what I was going to say. I think Manny's, uh, Manny's um, very uh, insightful uh, question really needs unbundling and further reflection along the lines of what Oscar was mentioning, because um, one also needs to distinguish between sh the short term and the long term uh, uh, in terms of influence of evaluation, but also, also whether management agrees or disagrees with the recommendations. In the short term, and if they agree, then the influence can quite easily be assessed through instruments that both Yuha and, and indicators that Yuha and Oscar mentioned. But one should not be, uh, um, one should not, uh, believe that an evaluation that management might not agree with will not have an influence over time. And I think we have seen many examples of such evaluations. And one concrete example, putting on my old IFAD hat, um, was the private sector evaluation done way back in 2010, when the management clearly in their management response disagreed to establish a private sector window, a private sector uh, you know, window for uh, providing funding directly to the private sector, but 10 years later, they did it. So one can argue that evaluations will also have influence over time, and e they will have influence even if the management at the time of evaluation disagrees with, with the findings and recommendations. So I think Manny's, discuss Manny's question really requires more, more reflection and, and, um, and thinking across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Ashwani. Nanti? Thank you. Um, I, I think uh, uh, we are in agreement, all of us here, from Yuha's point about management response to Oscars and uh, uh, Oscars and uh, Ashwani's point about uh, long-term and short-term influence. So, uh, Mani's question is very thought-provoking indeed. Um, my view is, it is. I agree with the Oscar that it is absolutely important that we analyze, we assess. How, what was the response uh, to the recommendations in terms of behavior change? And behavioral change also should indicate a ranking. Uh, there could be simple recommendations and there could be complex recommendations. So therefore we have to reflect on the recommendations themselves, how valid they are, how, how deeply um, uh, uh, deep changes they are asking. Uh, so it is a two-way process. One, we analyze our own recommendations and the other, how well uh, the behavior or how much the behavior is changing. And the complicating factor as pointed out, there is no time horizon. You have to stretch the horizon 
considerably. There, I would say there is no universal answer. That's what you, Vaska, uh, was in, uh, indicating. Each sec sector, each uh, evaluation has to decide, agree upon what would be their flow. What would be the flow of the kind of significant changes that they are expecting? It could go above that, but it can't go below that. I.e., for instance, in the thematic evaluation, we said, okay, at the minimum, you change, make sure that you have a conceptual framework to assess climate resilience, and they have it. So that would be a significant change for the programs that are coming afterwards. But we have to agree what is our flow, and then try to see that flow has been achieved, and then look at the other side and see how meaningful their guidance has been in terms of recognizing uh, the uh, resilience framework's importance and how complex and how accurate the uh, resilience framework they are building is. So it is two parts. Look at the recommendations, look at the um, action, and also look at what kind of behavioral changes you are seeking for and establish it when you are doing the evaluation or immediately after the evaluation to see what you want. And that determines, uh, we can agree then collectively that will be what could be influential and what could be not the influence washing, any changes influence kind of mode, we should avoid that. Some significant change has to be, some bar should be set for what would be a influence, what would it mean to say influence, over. Thanks a lot, Nandi. Um, I see a great comment from our former Director General of the Independent Evaluation Department. So he says, you know, it's a great session, influence is the essence of our evaluation work. And he points out that it's very important to distinguish among the three forms of influence. I think I touched on this briefly. There's instrumental use, uh, there's conceptual use, and there's advocacy use of, uh, of evaluations. Um, I think from some of the work that we've done at ADB, as he mentions there, we know that it's much easier to assess instrumental use. A conceptual and advocacy use are a bit more difficult because you don't see, you know, very uh, significant changes that, you know, that, that follow the evaluation. You don't have, that's not something you're tracking in the management action record systems. Uh, so does anyone have any reaction to that? Uh, from you know from, from your own work no I yes uh, please um, first okay. um, uh, delighted and very honored to have marvin among us really welcome uh, for for this uh, participation in this session great to, to see you marvin uh, yeah i think uh, uh, with this systemic approach uh, uh, in which we want to uh, really have a more transformative approach to evaluation as well as to the realities that we are assessing because of the urgency to address the big uh, development challenges of, of our time, uh, probably the, 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 the conceptual and the advocacy might be more influential at the systemic level. Right? However, we understand that those are really much more complex and difficult to track in terms of the influence that you can have at that level. But uh, uh, Ashwani was just pointing out uh, to one uh, uh, example that took 10 years uh, to uh, an organization to act upon uh, the, a, a change in ways of understanding the role of the of the of the organization to address very important needs of uh, uh, of different ways of addressing uh, rural development, for example, right? So it's much more difficult, but I think it's important to have these three uh, uh, different type of influence on on the table and reflect upon how can we uh, address those uh, with the work that we do on a daily basis. Thanks. Thanks, Oscar. Does anyone else have an opinion on this? Uh, if not, I have a question that I think is for if, which I will direct to first, um, and maybe Oscar can can add. So the question is: um, in our projects, that's agriculture, natural resources projects, are almost always accompanied by E and R M considerations, ostensibly. Adaptation should be part and parcel of ENRM activities. In a sense, was there any overlap in the measurement of in the measurement indicators? Was IFAD able to zero in on mitigation as well? So, Nandi, um, uh, I am not an expert in this, but let me. Uh, I'm sure Ashwani and uh, Oscar will have something to add as well. Uh, first of all, um, mitigation efforts, if I is just starting on that, it is primarily, it has been uh, climate adaptation. It is like 10 to 1 investment uh, difference. 
at, uh, for 500 million climate adaptation and 50 million mitigation kind of difference. So we are just starting on mitigation part. And in terms of uh, ENRM and uh, climate adaptation, they were treated as separate, uh, completely separate uh, entities. Um, uh, so the 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 guidance that is provided by the organization looks at for projects it treats climate adaptation separately from environmental guidance and when indicators are different and so on and so forth so there is a distinction made in the guidance between what is environmental um, we call it say cap which includes social environmental and climate um, uh, guidance so uh, the environment is separated from climate and there is a separate as we, recently they integrated the environmental and uh, strategy with climate strategy but uh, originally they were separate so there was a tradition of looking at them differently but increasingly they are integrated into one umbrella but still the indicators and so on and so forth to my knowledge are different i i will be happy to be corrected over yeah, so I see two questions. Um, one is quite broad. It says the behavior change component. Is it part of the evaluation's work? In principle, when will the evaluation work end? So I think it's a good question. Now, does it end with a report or does it end when the Mars actions are all completed? Oscar, you're smiling. Do you want um, to? Uh, please, but I, I see also you have with his hand up. Uh, but, uh, to me, it, it, it doesn't doesn't uh, end with a report. You know that that's to me is a short-sighted view of a very very functional view of evaluation, right? And that's why we refer that uh, uh, each evaluation process has a life of, of its own, right? Even beyond the publication of the report, not just by the dissemination. And now we are exploring ways in which the the utilization of evaluation can be even uh, well beyond that by by the use of artificial intelligence uh, to extract uh, evaluative evidence from databases of what we have done in the past and therefore uh, conceptually speaking it really goes beyond right and so that's what we need to really address the, the this development challenges that we are thinking about thanks oscar you how you had your hand up which i didn't see i'm sorry i missed you first yeah no, no worries, and and it's good that Oscar said that because uh, I I totally agree with uh, with him um, on on this issue, and and actually um, I have this uh, quote from the UN Evaluation Group, which actually, as it happens, Oscar is uh, current chair of, um, where where they point out also this uh, the role of evaluation uh, for knowledge generation and knowledge management and, and empowering stakeholders. And, and that obviously you know, goes beyond just uh, providing a, a, a report and, and just disseminating the report also because we are building this uh, wider knowledge base. I also wanted to link it to um, what uh, Anna was talking about in, in the Philippines. And, and um, I think uh, that is truly heartwarming to me. There's uh, far too much of this kind of a in, uh, inward looking, uh, navel gazing in, in, in evaluation within the uh, own organization and just, you know, seeing in words, how, the, how does the, in our case, the GEF, could it uh, improve its uh, operations or whatever. And then there's of course this old, um, old uh, tired so about the evaluation being uh, you know the donor's tool to 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 do things more you know cost effectively and whatever i think that it's uh, essential and what we have been trying to work systematically with this too is to make uh, uh, evaluations and the evaluation process and the evaluation findings uh, more useful and and particularly useful for them, for the uh, countries where which get the funding and where the projects and programs take place, actually, and 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 finding ways of how they can, um, you know, get more bang for their buck uh, from, from from the GEF, for example, and 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 how and and the Philippines examples are wonderful because they show also how they how this generated knowledge and, and experiences actually actually uh, have influenced uh, strategies and policy. 
Thank you so much, Yuha. Nandi, I see uh, you have your hand up, but we just have a I, couple uh, of minutes left in the session. Uh, I should, uh, if I may, just to quickly summarize, uh, I fully agree with Tosca and uh, Yuha brilliantly summarized. Um, my, this also um, underlies a assumption about evaluation. We think evaluation is an end in itself. It is a service industry for development. It's function is to serve development. Um, therefore, its work never should stop. It starts with the process itself, doesn't wait till the end. The process itself should cultivate an evaluation mentality among stakeholders. It kind of triggers a way of thinking. It should be served to trigger a way of thinking, results culture. And it starts with the beginning. The processes, as Shwani was pointing out, the, the processes are important in engaging, cultivating, bringing them to your line of thinking. Eventually, you transfer the skill to others. Uh, like uh, you have a one country should take over and start thinking evaluatively. And that's the end goal that we want. And then we will become obsolete. We, don't, we won't be needed. And everyone else will be doing the job for as it should be. They will be doing the evaluations themselves and think through evaluations in the planning evaluatively, in monitoring evaluatively, and then when they are um, looking at uh, results evaluatively. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks a lot to the panelists. I just have one final request of all of you. So you all, you know, listened to each other. You heard the questions from the audience. You responded to it. You reacted to things. Give me one word or one sentence for your key takeaway from the session. So maybe we can start with Anna, since she was the first to go. Thank you, uh, Maya. Well, my affirmation in this session, hearing from the experts, now, is that evaluation is actually making room, making room to pause, to reflect the choices we have made and the choices we are making, and then after that, support decision to allow and let in new, different, and better actions to define our Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Yuha, do you want to go next as the lead presenter? Sure. Um, I mean, I think there are some very clear messages, and it seems that we all have read the same book um, over the past 20 years or so. But, you know, basically, so the whole thing is that um, unless it is used, an evaluation has little or no value. So I think that's a basic thing. And, what um, I try to say in my presentation is that the utility of evaluations is enhanced by a number of factors and, and uh, see independence and credibility are very important, but also a structured uh, participation by the stakeholders at different levels is very important and, 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 and the timeliness of evaluations. And as Sashwani has said, especially pointed out is this, uh, uh, the evaluation culture. Thanks. Thanks, Yuha. Oscar, do you want to go next? Yes, and indeed, we have read the, the same books, and so uh, uh, di uh, difficult to add anything to what you have, have said. But if I would uh, uh, add, uh, I would say a challenge to evaluators, uh, bring novelty. Bring novelty from your analysis so that we can really look at that uh, uh, reality with fresh eyes, with that, with that novelty that would lead us to better results, improvement. And Nanti, can we have a word from you next? Sure. And I think uh, Mani's uh, question was uh, the summary of that, think influence and persevere. Um, I share the, uh, I mean, we are on the same book, so we are all on the same page. We are saying the same things in different ways, but uh, the point is, no easy answers. You have to hard work, persevere, continuously think about what is influence and then try to achieve that through systems or individual evaluations or a combination, whatnot. Over. Thanks, Nandi. Ashwani, the floor is all yours. Uh, as the newest okay. entrant to Asia, uh, you want to end with Thank you. Very briefly, I think the title of this session sums it all, and that I want to focus on the word utilization, because without utilization of evaluations, we won't be really contributing to transformation and change, which we want to achieve. So I think we as evaluators, but also the wider community should, when, when thinking of evaluations, and it links up to one of the questions that was asked earlier on, when does an evaluation end? I think we really need to focus also on the utilization of evaluations. Thank you and over.
Thanks a lot. I think we're at the end of the hour or the end of the half hour. So thank you. Thank a big thank you to all the panelists. I know some of you have stayed up very late. Others have woken up at a very early <laughs> hour. So we're very grateful for that. <laughs> Hope to see you in person the next time. Um, and of course, a big thank you to the audience for sticking with us. There's you know nearly a hundred of them still left standing which really I think <laughs> to the, speaks to the quality of the session, uh, if I may say so. So once again, thanks to the organizers. I know how much work this is. Uh, so we're very grateful that we could have a virtual event this year and we hope we can transition to a face-to-face -face event next year. Thanks everyone. <laughs>